Thank you. Uh, welcome to my talk. Yeah, my name is Michael Bush. I, I live in San Francisco, work there for Twitter. Um, I worked there since 2010, most of the time with a search team. And today I want to talk about, uh, maybe I've seen it last year, we launched a complete tweet index. It basically is a search index on Lucene that contains every tweet ever published. And um, I started in 2010, and the first thing there I did was basically take the existing search infrastructure and move it from back then, actually, my SQL implementation to, to Lucene, or to a Lucene modified uh, version. And this talk is about kind of a, we walked through those years since 2010, and I'm, I want to talk about the different things we added to our architecture to get to the point where we could launch this big index. All right, so let's start. Um, to start, I want to just mention a few of our numbers. We have more than 2 billion search queries per day. Um, it's probably even an outdated number. I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere, um, uh, so somewhere close to that and more. Uh, we have about 500 million tweets every day, and we, so that makes you know, hundreds of billions of tweets since 2006, so probably getting very close to a trillion now. Um, yeah, so it's it's you know a big it's it's big numbers that we get both in terms of traffic, uh, read traffic and write traffic. Um, yeah, so in 2010 or 2009, Twitter actually um, didn't have any search, and they acquired a small company called Semise, um, or maybe it was 2008. I don't know exact the exact year, um, and it was basically the first search engine uh, we had. Uh, back then, it only covered real-time search and only the most recent number of tweets, so only a few days back that you could search. It didn't provide any historical search. Um, looked like this back then. Um, the way kind of it, it worked back then was we had, as I said, MySQL databases actually on this, which is kind of an you know, interesting choice for a search engine, but it worked. Um, but because and you didn't get uh, great performance out of the MySQL boxes, we had these timeline caches, that's how we call them, on top. I think it's a little similar to the Elasticsearch percolator, um, where the cache key in these caches was actually an entire query, um, and the value was basically the materialized result set. And then we would scan uh, incoming tweets for uh, matches in the registered queries and update the result sets in that cache. So these timeline caches, of course, were all in memory, implemented in Ruby on Rails, uh, unfortunately. And yeah, we, uh, that was our system back then. So now going to 2011, um, I, as, as I said, we started the Lucene efforts, I believe, in you know, February or March uh, 2010. We worked on a replacement for the MySQL boxes. And then, yeah, in 2011, we, we, learned, uh, we launched Early Bird. That was our code name for the Lucene-based search. And the way it basically looked like, we wanted to have a very low-risk first deployment. So what we did was actually we only replaced the Early Bird machines in this architecture and kept the whole caching layer on top and, and everything else in place. Um, and the uh, high, kind of the characteristics of early bird were so it's an in in memory index based on a roughly on a version of Lucene, but a lot of memory models and data structures are uh, very um, changed and completely differently implemented. Maybe if you have if you have seen my talk in the like one or two years ago here, I talked in detail about how that works. And yeah, it's highly optimized for real-time search. It, uh, the downside, I guess, was it was limited to short documents. It was very optimized for the tweet use case. So uh, tweets have only 140 characters. So uh, we could only deal with 255 tokens in, in that early version of Early Bird. Um, and the cool thing kind of was that, uh, unlike in Lucene and Early Bird, you can actually search, uh, write and search on the same segment without having to, um, in a lock-free way, without having to flush the segment on disk or somewhere else in memory, like Lucene has to do it. So we could basically um, do it in memory uh, in place. Yeah, so and then actually in, so we, we launched it, it worked. Uh, we had the timeline caches on top. Then a, a pretty sad day happened in 2011. That was the earthquake in Japan. And we saw a lot of traffic that day, obviously. So uh, Jap in Japan, also Twitter is pretty, pretty popular. So a lot of people were tweeting about it, searching what happened. Lots of people in place, I think, were searching for like you know safe spots to go and, and stuff. And here was everything was falling apart because I think we were seeing I don't know 10x traffic than we would usually see. So actually, what happened was the timeline caches were kind of starting to completely fail. They were overloaded. 
And we had never actually tried out to just turn them off, and we, but we couldn't fix them and we, we didn't know what to do any, anymore. We were sitting there all night long. Um, so we, uh, we made the decision to just turn them off and see um, if early bird, how it would do, deal with the traffic. And then actually the whole system completely recovered and it turned out that actually early bird was faster than the caches. Um, not only because early bird was, uh, probably also because uh, the others were implemented in Ruby on Rails, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was kind of how we launched that. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about the ingestion pipeline. The, in, um, the real-time ingestion pipeline is pretty simple. We get a stream of tweets. Um, it's like a Kestrel queue back then. Um, and we feed that into the yellow box, which is the uh, kind of the Lucene analyzer equivalent. So an analyzer, if you know Lucene, does tokenization, uh, you know, language uh, detection, character normalization, that kind of stuff. And then we did also partitioning, which I'm going to explain on the next slide. And then we... Um, fed these pre-tokenized and pre-analyzed tweets into early bird for indexing. Um, our cluster layout is pretty sim uh, simple. It's a pretty traditional hash partition layout. So, you know, we have m hash partitions. The hash function is just tweet ID new mod m. And then, of course, to scale for read, la for read load, we have n number of replicas. So, if we want to, if we get, you know, if our traffic increases, we can just always add replicas. Uh, a new rows here to deal with the low traffic. Right. Um, yeah, here I want to point out something that's, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, different uh, if you compare early bird to Lucene. So in Lucene, the read and write direction is the same. So you obviously you index, you know, old to new documents, but you also have to search in that direction. For real time search, if you think about it, it doesn't make too much sense because usually, in, at least in Twitter's use case, you want to show the most recent documents. So performance wise, it makes much more sense to search in the opposite direction because then also when you found enough documents that you, for uh, rendering, you can actually do early termination and you don't, don't have to search your entire index. So that's actually one of the char characteristics of early bird that you can search in the opposite direction. Also, um, as I mentioned, we, have, we don't have to flush segments. The result of that is that we actually have fixed segment sizes and don't ever have to do any merging of segments. Makes it easier to operate the system because in Lucene you often have to find a good trade-off between how, you, um, how often do you reopen your index readers for latency reasons, but uh, also how do you deal with like, uh, merging later, will it slow down your, your cluster and that kind of stuff. So we don't have to worry about that at all. This is actually super easy to operate because the read performance and write performance is entirely decoupled. Yeah, and um, also you can see an early bird machine as a sliding window. If, he's, if the green segment here, if the current segment is full and we have to start a new current segment, then we actually just delete on the box the oldest segment. So it's always a sliding window of the most and recent tweets, like if, um, several days or weeks worth of tweets back then. I think I talked about all this, just a summary here. Um, yeah, so one cool thing about the segments, one benefit we have is we also can easily um, keep the different replicas in sync because we, again, we don't have to merge, so different replicas will always have the exact same segment boundaries. We know the segments haven't, weren't merged in different ways. So that makes it also possible to share segments across machines. Uh, in fact, when early bird has indexed a complete segment, it, it copies it in, onto HDFS. And then what we can do with it, we can use it if we, for example, want to do full cluster restarts. Let's say we, we want to re-index everything because we upgraded the analyzer version. We support a new language or, I don't know, we changed the data model or something else. So now we want to rebuild all the indexes. Then we do a um, rolling restart. So we take the first row of re replicas offline and we are over-provisioned in a way that it doesn't, uh, so uh, N minus one replicas can still handle all the traffic. So then these replicas need to index all tweets again with a new code. When they are done, they copy this, the complete segments onto HDFS. And then when we continue to the next row, um, takes the next row offline, the first one is online again, serves traffic, we take the next one offline. They don't have to re-index now, they can just copy the complete segments from HDFS onto their local, machine, uh, local disks, load them into memory and start serving much quicker than re-indexing everything. So yeah, only one replica in each hash partition actually has to re-index. That makes our deploys much faster. And also one benefit is, let's say, uh, you know, we need to bring a whole new replica into the system or 
uh, because we want to scale or because you know a machine failed, we need to repair the machine, then it's very quick to bring up a new machine because because it can just bootstrap all its data from HDFS and doesn't need to like uh, re-index everything. All right, now let's go to 2012. Um, so before 2012, we only had real-time search of the most n recent days. In 2012, we launched the first historical index. Uh, it was a pretty small one, I think about 2 billion tweets or so in memory. And uh, it covered basically the best tweets of all time. And best was defined by a certain relevance function, you know, mostly based on engagement metrics like retweets, favorites, that kind of stuff. But also, kind of, we made it a little bit more fair for different languages, um, because in certain languages, when you have um, you know, few users, then uh, th those tweets can't really compete with other markets where you have a lot of users in terms of engagement. So we made sure that we selected the same percentage-wise, the same amount of tweets from each language, and then scored them by our relevance function. So in terms of indexing technology, we didn't need, really need to change much because the index size was not too big for us, and um, so we could load it all into memory and just use our existing early bird indexing technology. But of course, now we actually had to process all tweets um, ever published. Because if you think about it, um, oh, one thing I want to mention, yeah, the online pipeline, of course, uh, handles only one tweet at a time. So that would obviously not be very efficient for processing historical tweets. Um, because if you think about it, even if you only want to have a few percent of all tweets in your final index, you still actually need to process every single tweet in your pipeline to find those best n percent of tweets, right? So uh, we need a pretty big, uh, we need a, a very paralyzable offline ingestion pipeline. That's what we came up with. The, the gray boxes here, or cylinders here, are data sets on HDFS, and the yellow boxes are, are jobs, mapper use jobs. Um, so we had uh, certain aggregators that would aggregate um, different engagement metrics, um, and we had an aggregator that would load then these um, engagements, also tweet data, user data, URL data, and, and probably more, and would um, merge it all into one document that we could that represented this tweet. Then um, we uh, had to, the analyzer job similar to the online pipeline. In fact, it also shares a bunch of code that would do the stuff that I mentioned earlier, tokenization, uh, language detection, that kind of stuff. Then we send that to a scorer that runs the relevance function that I talked about earlier, which selects the best tweets for each language. And then we feed it into the partition, and from then on, it's actually pretty similar to the um, real-time real -time index. Um, it's hash partitioned in a similar way. Um, oh, I, actually, everything I talked about, I have some, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about hash partition in a second. Um, the other component is, so the output then of the, of the previous job here, of the partitioning job, is basically files on HDFS that com contain pre-processed documents that are ready for indexing. Um, then actually the early birds would copy these files onto their local disk and actually build the segments in memory again. And then again do the same trick, copying complete segments onto HDFS so that only one replica row has to build the segments and then start serving it for memory. So, the, and again, the hash partition layout looked exactly the same. Number, fixed number of hash partitions, fixed number of replicas. Okay, so then we go to 2013. Now Twitter launched an SSD-based historical index. Still not the full, uh, full tweet index that contained every tweet, but a mat like an order of magnitude more tweets than in that in-memory index. Um, right, so... For this index, for the first time in Twitter, we actually used a vanilla on this codex, I think for maybe 4.3 index format. I, I can't remember the first version, but I think it was something like that. Um, with a few modifications, not in, on top of Lucene, not, not in the Lucene code itself. Um, some, of the, some of the modifications we had were uh, explicit caching of forward indexes, like doc values, for example, for certain reasons. One reason is basically updating documents. We, we can't update documents, on, on, we don't ha and we don't have to, um, in terms of the, the text that the tweet contains. Tweets are mutable in that regard. But certain update operations you have to perform, for example, if a tweet needs to be deleted in a certain country because it's illegal there, we need to take it down, and we also want to delete it from the, from the index, or mark it in the index as you know, deleted. So, and also, of course, people still 
especially if you search a historical uh, search engine, people tend to you know, favorite and retweet historical tweets more then. So then we also have, have to update those engagement metrics again. Um, so yeah, we, um, we have data structures in memory representing these doc values and these flags that we can update in place so that we don't have to actually delete the document and re-index the document. We can just do it in place. Um, we also had to do some very, yeah, uh, we spent a lot of time on hardware tuning for the SSDs we had. Um, and in fact, what very started was we worked closely with the hardware team um, on the first hardware configuration they suggested, and we kind of performance tested on a very low level the IOPS we would get from SSDs. We used both like a native tool. Um, we wrote a thin Java layer to see if it can actually, with a very simple Java program, um, verify that Java's MAP implementation lets us get the same number of IOPS. And then, you know, all looked fine, and then we deployed Lucene, and the performance sucked. So we weren't sure why, and we, we looked at the performance tools and we saw that we actually didn't get nearly the IOPS we were expecting. And then it turned out, it turned out that actually the hardware we got had some misconfigured kernels, um, Linux kernels, where, for example, flex were set wrong. Linux thought it was a rotational disk, in effect it was SSD, so I guess Linux does other things in terms of buffering. And, and there were a few uh, settings wrong. But kind of the lesson there was it was really good that before we actually did this hardware profiling because we knew what to, what to expect. If we hadn't done it, then we may not have known actually what performance to expect. So that was actually kind of uh, lucky that we did that. And um, otherwise, again, we used the traditional hash partition cluster layout that I talked about. And actually the only change to the offline ingestion pipeline was that the score needed to be modified, that it selects more tweets. Otherwise, we didn't have to change anything there. <clears throat> yeah, the only, and here the only change pretty much was that now we had early bird machines that could run in two, um, in two different ways, either out of memory, as I mentioned earlier, and now with uh, vanilla Lucene on disk. Yeah, okay, one thing I didn't mention was we also added some, because the index got much, much bigger, we added some additional skip lists that allowed us to skip over tweets that were previously not selected for this index. So for example, before we had only a few percent of the best tweets ever, right? So now you can think of, in the bigger index, you mark these, with a special posting list, you mark these tweets that are of higher quality in terms of engagement, you mark them uh, with a posting list, and now if you actually want to execute a, re a relevance query and find the best tweets, you take the original query and add that new posting list as a conjunction, and that allows you, allows Lucene to actually skip over the documents that have lower engagement and increase the performance. So we added some some additional skip list to, um, to keep the good performance for these kind of queries. Okay, fast forward to 2014. Now we finally launched the full tweet index. The full tweet index, again, is another order of magnitude bigger than the SSD index. And that cost us, this massive size cost us to, um, to do some changes regarding how we need to build indexes and how we can expand the indexes without having to repartition the existing ones. Um, so let's talk about the faster index builds first. That's how it looked like in the S first SSD index. The so the early birds would actually build indexes themselves locally before they would serve the traffic, right? Um, what we did was we actually changed that and introduced a new component we call just a segment builder. It's actually a job that runs on Mesos. Do, are you guys, do you guys know what Mesos is? Um, hands up. Yeah. So Mesos is basically a cluster management layer that can share resources and can give, you know, allocate resources for jobs that you submit. So um, for any kind of process you want to run for Docker containers, for JVMs, that kind of stuff. So we used Mesos to um, execute, when we, want to re when we want to build this big index, execute like thousands of jobs to build these segments and copy them onto HDFS. And then early birds would only need to like wake up and copy these segments onto their local disk and start serving them. Um, so that way we can easily scale in those rare times when we actually have to rebuild this massive index and otherwise we can give the resources back and share them with other teams. Yeah. Okay, so now how can we, if you look at this picture, how can we expand this index without repartitioning? It's not easy, right? Because the only way to make more room for more documents here is actually to add another hash partition. But that also changes your hash function, which means you have to like re, um, rebuild the entire index. So we, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want every single time we, need, we add more hardware to re, rebuild everything. 
So what we did was we came up with the idea of having different tiers. And a tier here, this is like the, the reddish box, a violet box, um, is in itself has a has this hash partition layout with a fixed number of replicas and, and hash partitions. And it covers a fixed time range. So for example, the one on the top maybe covers you know, 2006 to 2010. And the next one covers years 11 and 12, because oh, uh, less, less actual time because we had more tweets there. Um, right. So now every time we actually run out of space here, we can just add a new, whole new cluster. We don't have to modify the existing ones and just add hardware in a new cluster and then start, start indexing there um, with, a, with new hardware. The nice thing is that clients never have to talk to early birds directly and they never have to know how many tiers there are. So we basically have what we call an early bird root service. It's a thrift aggregation service that actually calls the hash partitions and replica machines. And uh, we have multiple levels of these root machines, uh, root services. So we have for each tier, we have one level that merges responses from all those hash partitions. And then we have another tier that merges respon these responses from the different tiers together into the final response. You know, takes care of um, you know, maybe deduping or um, scoring, sorting. And then returns the final response to the client. So the client actually doesn't need to know much about the underlying partitioning layout. Right. Yeah, um, that's, I think I talked about all these points. Yeah, one kind of unrelated thing, I still want to mention it because it also happened in 2014 and it's, I think, interesting to the Lucene community is that we also launched a new um, format for our in-memory real-time indexes. Now they could actually deal with the full position space that Lucene can deal with. Now it becomes actually very interesting for a general use case, not only tweets. Uh, and now it's actually much more interesting to open source this technology than it was before, that's why I want to mention it. And I sent this tweet, I remember I sent this tweet also when I uh, deleted the old code and kind of thought it was kind of cool that it served about a trillion, a trillion queries um, when we retired it. Cool. Okay, now 2015. What are we doing right now? So, um, we kind of solved the problem of scaling the index when we run out of space and need to add new machines just to make room for new documents. But now we are a search infrastructure team and we have internal, also a lot of internal customers in Twitter that want to annotate tweets with additional metadata. So maybe they came up with a new model that can measure the quality of a tweet and they want to annotate all tweets with that new kind of score. <clears throat> so the current solution is actually that we have to because we need to modify the Lucene documents, we actually need to rerun the entire pipeline and re rebuild everything you saw. And that takes like, a long time, right? Even if you run it on MapReduce and Mesos, it, it takes a long time. So, and it also, if you think about it, does a lot of unnecessary work because the majority of the documents actually didn't change at all. The text didn't change. The only thing that changed, we added an, a new field to it. So the idea is to use a um, technology that Lucene has actually for a long time. It's called the Parallel Index Reader. And what you can do with it is, that you can actually distribute the fields that are in one, normally in, in, in one Lucene segment onto, into multiple parallel segments that have the requirement is they have to spend the exact same doc ID range and have the same order ring of uh, doc IDs. Um, but then the fields are stored in separate files on disk. And then you can also actually append a new parallel segment and then the parallel index reader in Lucene actually makes it look like it's one big segment and the, all the you know, searching code, your queries, Boolean queries and stuff, they actually don't know, know the difference. And performance-wise, it's actually also not a difference because the storage layout is very similar. It's just basically stored in, in different files. So that's cool. Um, but also now to produce these segments, we, we are working on making this whole ingestion pipeline, we are par paralyzing the whole ingestion pipeline. So we are basically adding um, the ability that you can um, group in the very beginning of the, of the pipeline, you can group your fields and you can define field groups. So for example, in, in, our, in our current example, the existing tweet maybe is field group one and this new field that team wants to add, um, we define as field group two. So now we only need to you know, run the pipeline for this group two, for this new field. Of course, it's much less data, it's very quick to, to do that and it produces these small segments, parallel segments on HDFS. And then the only thing the early birds need to do is basically copy these small segments onto their disk, 
And um, they don't even need to restart. They can just load the incremental, you know, the additional data into memory and, and start serving it using the parallel reader. And no restart was necessary. That's what we are working on right now. Um, the second thing I want to mention is that we also worked on making our code a little bit nicer, um, which is interesting for open sourcing it. So before we had like a lot of technology for the archive index, for the for the historical index, for real time search. Also, we have like other search engines I have mentioned yet for user search, and they all kind of had spaghetti dependencies and they like depend on each other and use some shared some technologies, but not all of it. So what we actually did was last year and this year we kind of put a lot of the nice concepts that a lot of these indexes actually share into an Lucene extension library that is completely independent of a specific data model or product at Twitter. And it pretty much only depends on Lucene and has the has things in there like the segmenting concept and, and some tools that we use and now we can easily share them and we could decouple these dependencies. And this could actually also be an interesting component to open source at some point. Yeah, the, what's basically in this library is it's, it's kind of an abstraction layer for segments. Um, Lucene has that kind of on the search side already. Now we kind of added it for the index writer. Um, it has a few other things like a schema that you can, like probably Elasticsearch and Solar have that too. Um, we have our own schema version and we have some code for real-time faceting. Um, the API layer basically introduces concept like um, an index segment writer, and we have then two different implementations, one for the in-memory real-time segments and one for the on-disk, uh, kind of a wrapper for the vanilla Lucene on-disk segments. But then the code that manages it doesn't need to know the difference. It, can just, it just knows, okay, here are segments, and I need to maybe copy a segment to HDFS or from Mesos or whatever. Um, so it's kind of nice in that way. It's a nice abstraction layer. Yeah, and then index segments can be built in real time, they can be built on Mesos, they can be built as we did in the first SSD version locally on the early birds, and we can with that library share segments across HDFS and everything I talked about, can manage versions of the segments, um, upgrade them if we need to and that kind of stuff. I think that's it. Um, a very extremely short demo, which I I could, I, could, I could do it live, but I don't know. I could also just do it this way because it's simple. If you, uh, back then, for the first Berlin bus words, I remember that we, I don't think we had to be bus hashtag yet, so I uh, tweeted with a long version. That's why it's easy to find it now. And uh, I just searched the other day and noticed, remember, for example, that we had to whitelist the conference because Twitter thought it was uh, <laughs> spammers or whatever that were attacking them uh, from the same IP. So those were very early days, um, and I remember I was excited to come to the first buzzword. So, so it's a nice use case that now actually you can make every uh, tweet searchable and kind of uh, find your old tweets or someone else's old tweets. And I think that's it. Um, questions? <laughs>